Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the NIEHS Exposure, Spot, Exposure Science in the Exposed Zone webinar series. This morning, we are going to be having a presentation from Martin Vrieshide at Creol in Barcelona, uh, speaking about the Helix Consortia, which is one of three European Union-funded uh, efforts to uh, demonstrate the potential and power of the Exposed Zone concept. Martin is an environmental epidemiologist with a focus on early life exposures and health effects in children, and that is the major focus of the Helix Consortia, uh, which, he, which Martin will be presenting to us. With that, I will turn the podium over to Martine and look forward to her presentation. Thank you. Right. Good morning, everyone. I, I would like to start by thanking David Bolshaw and the NIHS for, for organizing this very interesting uh, webinar series and for giving me the chance to um, to explain the Helix project to you. And uh, the idea is really to to um, to give you some first uh, ideas of the steps that we are taking to put the uh, to put the expo home into practice. And as we've already said. This talk will be mainly based on the Helix project, uh, one of the three main uh, explosion projects funded by the European Union um, in the fifth, in the seventh framework program. Um, this is an outline of today's talk. I will st start with a few words on, on why we've chosen the early life as an important um, period for, for developing the explosion. Um, I'll mention the Exposome as a framework for, for doing this work, and then I will, will explain the Helix project, and I will go through the concept of the project, the design of the project, and give you some first flavors of the ongoing work in Helix. So, to start with the importance of early life, um, this is nothing new. Many of you will be familiar with the um, with the the Dohad paradigm, which is that of the developmental origins of health and disease. And this is a paradigm that states that exposures during critical fetal and infant periods lead to developmental adaptations, which can predispose individuals to development of um, of uh, non-communicable diseases later in life. And then there are quite a lot of uh, examples of early developmental exposures that might lead to non-communicable diseases later in life. Um, and here is a slide showing some of the main work that has been done in with um, looking at the influence of exposure to extreme undernutrition and the effects that might have on phenotypes later in life. And there's a, there's a whole range of, of uh, phenotypes later in life that are determined by the, the very early undernutrition uh, during pregnancy. Now, taking that to the environmental exposures, uh, we think there is a role for environmental chemicals within the Dohad hypothesis. And that is because common mechanisms have been found and mainly in experimental work for uh, environmental chemicals acting in very similar, through very similar mechanisms to the nutritional disturbances. Um, so there is certainly a, a whole community that, that believes that research and disease prevention strategies should focus much more on the vulnerable early life stages. And these are the main reasons why we've chosen pregnancy and child health as our main focus of research. Um, we know that these are vulnerable periods uh, where organs develop very rapidly. And on this slide, uh, I've put an example of the, uh, of the brain development in very early life. And it's, and it's very clearly shown that the main uh, development of the brain happens during pregnancy, but also in the first few years of life. There's a very rapid increase of, of several ex executive functions. Uh, for example, here the intention control, cognitive flexibility, all of these curves uh, are at their steepest early in life. And, and um, this makes early life a very, very vulnerable period to environmental insults as well. 
On top of that, children have specific intake behaviors, specific metabolisms that, that may make them more vulnerable. Any influence early in life has a lifetime influence. So your exposure very early in life obviously is going to accumulate during your life. And, and the prevention early in life, if we can actually reshape programming, if we can uh, bring uh, adverse effects back onto the normal curve, uh, this is an, a particularly uh, effective time period for, for prevention. So those are all reasons for studying pregnancy and early childhood. If we do a quick review of what is known about exposures and health effects in children, uh, we find that there are actually very few exposures with good epidemiological evidence. And this is a, this is a, a review that we did quite quickly, um, looking at a, a list of, of environmental exposures, including chemicals, air pollution, but also some biological exposures like mold, uh, some uh, physical exposures like noise and, and uh, ultraviolet radiation, and an exposure like green spaces, which is more to do with the built environment. And if we look at various child health outcomes, birth weight, obesity, neurotoxicity, immunotoxicity, and the respiratory system, we see that there are very few uh, exposure outcome uh, combinations where there is good evidence uh, from, from epidemiology. So there's still a lot of work to be done. <coughs> so where does that bring us right now in 2014? What, what the table I've just shown you is an overview of the, of the evidence we have for effects of chemicals on child health. But what is very clear that all the studies done up to now, almost all, have looked at one chemical or one exposure and one health effect. Up to now, there's very few studies that have been able to look at uh, multiple exposures or mixtures of chemicals. At the same time, we know that today's chemical exposures are characterized by a very wide selection of chemicals, mainly at low levels. For example, mixtures of endocrine disruptors or mixtures of air pollutants. Um, we're not exposed to one chemical. We're exposed to, to mixtures of low-level uh, chemicals. And very very, very few epidemiological studies have been able to, um, to take that into account. And that is, the reason why they haven't been able to do it is because there's, there's very large challenges in evaluating effects of multiple exposures. We have generally have very low statistical power to take account of more than one exposure, let alone we're looking at interaction terms, interactions between exposures. Also, we're dealing with a highly correlated exposures. A lot of these exposures, especially within a common group of exposures, uh, are highly correlated. And um, when we when we do tr have the data and we try and test for multiple uh, exposures, we we run into uh, multiple testing and false discovery rate problems. So this is one area where where up to now uh, not much work has been done. Um, the second area is, is, is more to do with what data we have available. The, the state, exposure data is very scattered. We have very good uh, studies on particular exposures. We have very good uh, studies, for example, on mercury exposure or on PCB exposure or on air pollution exposure. We don't have studies that, or we have very few studies that have data for a wide range of exposures. Um, so we don't actually know how uh, exposures coexist in our environments, let alone how they interact together to, give to, to, to lead to health effects. But first of all, we do not even know if there are, uh, how they coexist in different populations. Uh, exposure data is uncertain, and this is nothing new. Um, uh, exposure assessment is one of the, one of the most difficult uh, areas and uncertainties in exposure assessment. Are, uh, are always an issue. And another issue is that we don't actually know very much about the critical period uh, when chemicals might have an, an effect on, on, on health. And we, don't, we know very little about the developmental adaptation mechanisms. 
very little work has gone into that. <coughs> On top of that, there are new concerns. And uh, a lot of the old, I'm saying old, but a lot of the studies that we started, say, 10 years ago, especially the, the cohort studies and the birth cohort studies, They've done a lot of work on environmental exposures and health effects. Um, they were not set up to look at new concerns. And uh, so, for example, new concerns now relate to, to non-persistent chemicals. And we know that uh, measuring non-persistent chemicals in one spot, urine sample, may not be uh, the best way to do it. It's, it's, it is a very certain uncertain measurement of exposure, but uh, very few of our studies were set up to take more than one uh, urine measurement because uh, 10 years ago, when, when the birth cohorts were started, we didn't, uh, we didn't set, design these studies well to, to, to deal with the new concerns. And, and there are similar issues about uh, other new uh, environmental health concerns. Uh, becoming more important now, such as the built environment and, and green space research. So there is really a need for new uh, methods to be integrated in, in, in studies uh, requiring new methods. So that's where we are in 2014. And um, that brings me to the, the Expo Zone as a concept. Um, I think we all we all familiar with the definition, Chris Wild's definition, which was uh, that the expo zone was there to represent um, all environmental exposures, including those from diet, lifestyle, and endogenous sources, from conception onwards, uh, as a critical um, uh, quantity in disease etiology. And Chris Wild really developed this to uh, to 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 have the expo zone as a complement to the genome looking for something as complete as the genome is in, in genetic research. Um, now, could the Expo Zone be a useful framework to answer some of, or to address some of the issues that we, we are dealing with uh, in early life environmental research? Not just early life, but life course uh, environmental health research as well, but uh, I'm focusing here on the early life. And, um, at least in the Helix project, we thought the Expo Zone could be a very useful framework because of, uh, first of all, because of its very holistic approach to the environment. The Expo Zone, as defined by Chris Wiles, includes uh, not only an, an, a specific external part, which is all the chemical contaminants and lifestyle factors, but also a much more general environmental uh, general external part, which is more uh, a person's social capital, education, urban rural environment, climate, etc. And then there is a whole part that is the, uh, our internal environment, our metabolism, our microflora, our, our uh, oxidative stress, um, and many other internal uh, processes that make up the, the internal part of the exposome. Um, another part that, of the Expo Zone that is, uh, that is attractive for us is the, um, the different ap approaches to measuring the Expo Zone. Um, as Chris Wild has explained in, in one of his papers, uh, the Expo Zone has several methodological approaches that could be seen as, as, as important. Uh, for example, the biomarkers, the omics biomarkers, the, the, the use of high throughput molecular methods to uh, to measure chemicals inside the body is 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 attractive from an from an uh, an expert on point of view. But also, if we if we look at some of the issues outstanding in, in environment and child health research, uh, these could be very useful methods for looking at. Um, at mechanisms, at, especially at the, uh, at the uh, developmental adaptation mechanisms in which we are interested. Uh, other technologies, other methods that could be of interest are the sensor technologies, where uh, we could we could use a range of sensors to get much more uh, information on on personal um, exposures and 
And there, there are many other methods that, um, that could be used. But what brings these methods together, I think, is, the, is their integrative uh, uh, characteristics. So when we think about exposome methods, we have to think of methods that can deal with, uh, with more than one exposure variable at the time. So uh, methods that can really integrate more than one um, exposure, more than one measurement. Now, of course, the, the exposome has many challenges. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a, a concept of me with many dimensions. It's got a life course dimension. It has an internal, ex external dimension. Um, it, it, uh, it has a multiple exposure dimension. And these are not easy to deal with within an epidemiological study. Although the exposome was specifically designed uh, as an epidemiological concept, it's, uh, these type of dimensionality the issues are, are, are not easy to study. For example, it's not easy to find a study population where we have samples or where we can do an exposure assessment from conception till, till death. I mean, that, is, that in itself is a, is a big challenge. Temporal variability, uh, we were dealing with many exposures, with many different uh, temporal variabilities. There are, as I said before, exposure measurement issues. Uh, and when you look at multiple exposures, obviously your, mul your exposure measurement issues are going to be multiplied. So you, we're looking not just at uh, uncertainty and errors in one exposure, but uncertainty and errors in, in many, many exposures. There's the question of how to integrate omics tools, um, how to actually match epidemiology and, and the omics technologies. Um, statistical methods. Uh, we know that our traditional regression analysis methods are not, um, are not good at dealing with multiple uh, exposure variables. So there's really a need for developing new, um, new methodologies and testing them on, on the right data sets. And then there's a whole issue of the interpretation because the exposome moves from a, uh, from, uh, a, a much more hypothesis-driven um, philosophy to a much more open uh, agnostic philosophy. And um, so there are a lot of issues about interpretation that we are, uh, we are dealing with. And that brings me to Helix. Helix is a project that was... Um, that started uh, one and a half years ago. It's funded by the European Union, and it's, uh, its main aim is to actually start dealing with some of these challenges. Um, it's, uh, as I said before, this is a, a project funded by the seventh framework of the European Union, and it has 13 partners across Europe working on this study. When we are a mix of um, a mix of epidemiology and lab partners. So we have epidemiolo epidemiology groups responsible for the birth cohort in the study, and then we have lab partners responsible for the for the omics work and for the chemical analysis work. <coughs> and this is the overall aim of Helix. Um, our aim is to, to develop and exploit novel tools and methods. Um, and there's a whole list of methods that we want to try and, and use in the study, including remote sensing, um, spatial methods, omics-based approaches, exposure biomarkers and devices, statistical tools for combined exposures, and burden of disease methodologies. And the idea is to use these methods to char characterize early life exposure to a, a wide range of environmental hazards. So we're not dealing with one exposure, we're dealing with a wide range of uh, early life exposures. And then <clears throat> we will link those to data on major child health outcomes. And we've defined three main areas for our outcomes, which is growth and obesity, neurodevelopment, and immune and respiratory system outcomes. And this is the way we would, yeah, we would be working on developing an early life exposome approach. And here is our conceptual framework. Um, this project is, is built in three steps. Um, the first 
step, and, and a very important step, is the measurement of the ex external exposome, um, meaning all our exposures from food, from consumer products, from water, from indoor air, from outdoor air, and other exposures in the outdoor environment. Um, this project uh, was funded by the Environment Program of of uh, of the Seven Framework Program, so it's not a pro. It's a project that specifically looks at environmental contaminants, not so much at the wider environmental factors such as diet. We've split the work of measuring the external exposome in two parts. One part is uh, focused on, on exposures that are measured more on the individual level with biomarkers, questionnaires, uh, and exposure modeling. The second part is are those exposures that are measured more uh, on an outdoor level using um, GIS spatial uh, models. So that's the main split we've made. After measuring the external exposome, um, there's two parts of the project that are more looking at integrating this. Uh, first of all, integrating the exposures, looking at multiple exposure patterns. How do these exposures correlate? Um, and what type of groups of uh, can we find in the population with similar exposure? That will then be linked to the omics work, where we try to in integrate molecular signatures. So we're trying to see if these exposures, uh, if we can find specific signatures uh, in using the omics, the high throughput omics uh, analyses. And that then will be linked to child's health using uh, statistical methods for multiple exposure analyses. And finally, there's a, a work package that will uh, look at the environmental burden of childhood disease. These are the six cohorts that participate in Halix. Um, we have co uh, the MOBA cohort from Norway, Kankin in Lithuania, Rea in Greece, BIP in the United Kingdom, even in France and in, uh, in Spain. And together, these cohorts uh, study around 30,000 subjects. And they have been following these uh, mothers and children since about 2003, 2004. And they have more or less the same age range uh, now in, the, in these cohorts. So we've tried to. In selecting these cohorts, we try to get a spread around Europe. We try to get similar age ranges, and we try to work with cohorts that have a, spe a specific expertise in environmental uh, exposures. So a lot of these cohorts have already worked on um, on several European projects together, and they have already char characterized uh, several uh, environmental exposures. For example, they were all part of the ESCAPE air pollution project, so they all have already uh, modeled air pollution data in their study areas. And that helps a lot for, uh, for setting up this new project. If we look at the, the study design uh, of Helix, um, we start with this basis of, of 32,000 mother-child pairs from the six cohorts. And there is a lot of data already in these cohorts. Uh, includes exposure data, uh, outcome data, and uh, many covariates, social factors, diet, physical activity. And this has all been asked from the, from the mothers uh, in questionnaires, and, and some cohorts have good biomarker, exposure biomarker data already. So we're building on a, on a base of existing data that is uh, not the same in all cohorts, but it can be harmonized, and we, we're working on that currently. Also, uh, for these cohorts, for the entire cohorts, the idea is to, to build new spatial models for all the outdoor exposures of interest uh, in Helix, in Helix. And in that way, we would build an outdoor exposome. And I'll, I'll show you an example of that in, in a minute. From those entire cohorts, um, we have selected a sub-cohort of 1,200 mother and child pairs so 200 from each cohort. <clears throat> and in these mothers and children, we will, uh, we will 
will build our total exposome, which means we will measure exposure biomarkers to a range of chemicals. Um, we will do our omics work on these 1,200 subjects. We will, uh, and we are now collecting new data on, on outcomes, on health outcomes, on behavior, on diet, on social factors. And we're taking new, um, new samples, new biological samples uh, for a lot of the exposure and omics work so that we have a very, uh, very much a common protocol and a common database uh, in 1,200 subjects. We then have some very intensive, detailed panel studies, uh, a children's panel study that's nested within the sub-cohort. So 150 children from the sub-cohort participate in our uh, panel studies, where they carry, uh, they carry smartphones to look at their geolocalization. They carry exposure sensors to get personal monitoring data. They fill in diaries, and they give uh, repeat urine and blood samples. And I'll come back to the design of those panel studies uh, in a minute. And then the last aspect of the study is the health impact assessment, where we finally, hopefully, uh, will feed in the exposure estimates and exposure response estimates from the study, from Helix, but also from, uh, from what is already known in the literature into a specific burden of disease estimates and into uh, uh, benefit harms uh, risk assessment scenarios. And on a timeline, uh, the study design looks like this. We have our entire cohort with existing data here along the whole timeline. We have a sub-cohort where we're doing a lot of intensive work now. Um, exposure biomarkers, omics data, outcome data. This is all newly collected data at the age of six to nine years of the children. And then we have two panel studies that uh, collect the intensive uh, exposure biomarker and omics data. <coughs> now, I've got a few examples of how we have set up the sub-cohort examinations of the children. So all the 1,200 children who are participating in our sub-cohort are now being examined this year uh, with a detailed um, uh, protocol, the same in each of the six countries. And that includes uh, a neurodevelopment computer testing protocol with various uh, tasks of various domains of neuropsychological development that we are focusing on such as fine motor abilities, language and communication, attention, and executive function. And this is done through, the, um, through computer tests and through parental questionnaires. On top of that, apart from the neurodevelopment, the children are assessed for weight, height, blood pressure, bioimpedance, uh, circumferences, and skin folds. And they are doing a sp spirometry test. They give us their urine samples from the night before and of the morning of the visit. So we have two, uh, two urine collections. And all of the children uh, give bl a blood sample at the end of the uh, examination. And this is all documented in standardized operating procedures so that uh, in each country we can follow the same uh, procedures. There are very intensive questionnaires during the visit with the mother. Um, so the mother answers questions about the green spaces, water consumption, indoor air, noise, diet, physical activity, time activity, sleep, etc. Uh, also about respiratory and allergic outcomes. And we've developed an interesting uh, part of the questionnaire was to try and get a good address and uh, commuting history of the children. And we found that it's very difficult to, for mothers to do in a, in a normal questionnaire. Uh, if they have to give exactly the addresses of each place where the child uh, goes and how they commute, it's actually quite dif difficult. So one tool we've developed is called the QGIS, which is a, a map-based uh, tool where the participants, the mothers in this case, can click the address of origin and the address uh, of uh, where the child goes, for example, the school. They can click where the house is, they can click where the school is, and they can click the route through which the child commutes to school. 
So each of our 1,200 sub-cohort participants is filling in one of these QGIS uh, um, questionnaires, and that gives us very detailed information about the commuting routes, and we will be able to use that for our assessment of, uh, of air pollution, for example. Similar for the, this, this is an example of the panel study protocol um, where we followed 150 children and 150 pregnant women for two weeks in two different seasons. So this week is repeated for the same individual six months later. And these participants carry, for one week, they carry a smartphone that will measure mobility and physical activity. They carry an actigraph as a, as a validation of the physical activity measurement. They carry a UVR dosimeter, which measures their ultra, ultraviolet uh, radiation. They give us urine uh, three times a day to uh, look at variability, temporal variability in non-persistent pollutants. They fill in diaries, and they have uh, indoor pollutant sensors installed in their houses. All of this data is collected over, over a full week. And the last 24 hours of that week, um, the, the children carry a, a backpack with personal air pollution sensors. That includes a PM2.5 uh, pump and um, a micro that measures uh, real-time black carbon uh, exposure. They also have... Uh, PM2.5 sensors installed in the house for these last 24 hours. And that is followed then by uh, the health examination and blood sampling. So this is a very intensive week, and um, it will provide us with a lot of information on the variability of the exposures, uh, and it will help us to validate the exposures in the, in the larger study. So the first, I would want to go in... in into a little bit more detail on the first aspect of the study, which is the measuring of the external exposome. Our first part, as you may remember, is the individual exposures. Uh, this is what we measure in the work package on the individual exposures. We have a list of, a fairly standard list of pollutants that are, are measured in, in the blood and urine samples of the sub-cohort participants. And here we aim to have measurements uh, during the pregnancy, going back to the stored samples of the mothers. And the, same, and the same chemicals will then be measured in the newly collected samples of the children at the age of six to nine years. So we will have a prenatal and a postnatal bio, uh, biomarker uh, measurement. In the panel studies, we will analyze the daily repeat samples uh, the urine samples collected, uh, and there we will uh, use these urine samples to look at the short-term variability in some of the non-persistent chemicals in the phthalates, the phenols, and the organophosphate uh, pesticides. We have um, one aspect of this work package also is to develop a, a pharmacokinetic model for two uh, model compounds. PFOS and DHP, so one of the more persistent chemicals, one of the perfluorinated, and one of the phthalate uh, non-persistent chemicals. And then uh, there's two other exposure groups, the water disinfection byproducts and the indoor air pollutants that are measured within this work package through uh, a combination of questionnaires, indoor air monitoring, and data from the water companies. A biomark as a biomarker, we will only have uh, no. We will measure the cotinine in, in, in the children of our sub cohort. So one aspect that is important for us in the, looking at individual exposures is the temporal variability, especially in non-persistent chemicals, where we know that uh, there is a very high uh, uh, intra-individual vari variability. In, in biomarker measurements, and uh, we will use the panel studies to get repeat biomarker measurements to characterize some of these uncertainties and uh, to, to quantify the errors for when we do the analysis in the larger cohort. 
Another aspect is, uh, as I already mentioned, is the use of pharmacokinetic models. And these are specifically, they may specifically be used for an epidemiological study to model between biomarker measurements. So if we have a biomarker measurement here, we, we might not be sure whether the exposure scenario behind that is the green line, the blue line, or the red line here. And, and one thing we want to do is test uh, the representative, representativeness of, of one single time point, for example, for this phthalate measurement, to estimate the scenario of exposure using one, two, three, or more biomarker measurements and questionnaire data. And this is fairly uh, preliminary work that I think will give us some ideas, at least, of the, how, use, how useful the, uh, the uh, PBBK models are in, in, uh, in building an exposome um, in early life. And then uh, in the second work package, we measure outdoor exposures. As I've said, we focus on five to five outdoor exposure areas, air pollution, noise, the built environment, and green spaces, UV radiation, and temperature. And this is done in two, in, in two main ways. Um, first of all, we have spatial temporal models based on GIS and remote sensing. And those spatial temporal models give us exposure estimates for our entire study areas. Um, we also have personal monitoring that gives us much more detailed uh, information on where the variability is in these exposures and where, where the variability comes from. So with personal monitoring, um, we've developed a personal monitoring kit that is carried in the backpacks by the kids, um, and that contains a smartphone. This smartphone contains an app called the Expo app. And that Expo app combines location data from the phone, so the GPS data, and the physical activity data measured by the phone from the accelerometer in the phone into, um, it combines that information uh, so that we can download it easily. These children also carry exposure sensors, as I've already said. They carry PM2.5 pumps, black carbon uh, microthermometers, and, and UV uh, wristwatches. And this is an example of, of how the personal monitoring kit looks. Uh, this is the backpack carried by a child. It has the pumps for the air pollution uh, inside the backpack. And then around the waist, the children carry uh, a smartphone that, is made, that is, uh, has the export app installed on it. This phone cannot be used for making phone calls. It's really only there to register the child location and movement. And this is uh, a comparison. This is the output from the Expo app in, in terms of physical activity. This is measured in METs. And it, here we compare the results of an actigraph carried by the same child with the Expo app, the, the, the phone uh, app measuring the, um, the physical activity. And we see very, good, we find very good correspondence, which means that the accelerometers in the phone give very good uh, data on physical activity um, compared to the actigraph. The actigraph is our is our gold standard here. And then this is an example of the output of the microaccelerometers, which is a, a a way of getting real time exposure air pollution exposure data. The red line is the crude, and the blue line is the smooth um, black carbon estimates that read out from the from the microethylometer carried by by one of our children. So we see uh, we we get a very nice uh, idea of exposure over a 24-hour period. Now, once we've got that, once we've got the phone data, the location data from the phone, the physical activity data from the phone, and the micro data on black carbon, we can make maps such as this one, which shows for each point of, the, of a person's commuting route uh, their um, air pollution exposure. So we can combine the location data of the air pollution, personal air pollution exposure data. And even more, we can combine 
the physical activity data with the location data and the air pollution data. So here, the blue line, the height of this blue line shows the level of physical activity. So this is a person walking, whereas here I think the person is on a train or in a car. Whereas the higher this peak, the, the more physically active the person is. And um, the underlying map, the, the green, yellow, and red, that shows the, um, the air pollution models that we have. This is the city of Barcelona. So this is a way of overlaying physical activity, uh, GPS location data, and um, air pollution models. And this is the type of information we expect to get from our panel studies. Now, as I said, part from the personal exposure monitoring part, there is a, a part of the project that builds spatial temporal models for our study areas, for our six study areas. Um, there is a lot of work at the moment to build the GIS environment uh, to try and get estimates on, on a range of, of outdoor exposures. And finally, we have named this, renamed this the Outdoor Expo Zone, which would be like a, a trying to capture potentially spatially clustered environmental health influences related to the built environment and, and related to our outdoor environment. Um, and here are some of the examples of the maps that are, we are putting together now. Um, this is an example of Barcelona. We have a PM2.5 uh, land use regression model already made from, the, from one of our other projects, the escape project. So this is an example of data that, that will be put together for each of the six uh, helix study areas. This is temperature data. This is, again, the city of Barcelona uh, showing the, an NDVI index, index which is uh, a greenness index. And the same for the road traffic noise levels. So as you can see, we have many outdoor exposures uh, mapped already. And we are just, at the moment, gathering all this data for the six study areas under study. So that finally, for the entire cohort, these 32,000 subjects, we will have our outdoor exposome, and uh, we will be able to link that to the existing health information uh, and outcomes in the in the cohorts. So step two of the project would be to integrate the exposome. Uh, first of all, looking at integrating all our external exposures and then matching that to our internal exposome, meaning the, the molecular part of the, of the exposome. In terms of multiple exposures and patterns, uh, we have a work package that has a very descriptive aim, with, and its, its aim is to describe the correlations between the exposures coming up with pictures like this. This is very preliminary data from our IMMA cohort, where we, we have already information on, on about, well, just over 100 exposures during a pregnancy uh, arranged in these different groups. So we can already make correlation uh, maps, uh, looking at the correlations between all these different exposures. And this is something that Helix will go into much further with, with each of the, with all of the helix, uh, helix exposures, um, both in the outdoor environment, in the individual environment. And then we also want to look at uh, patterns in these exposures using, uh, using clustering methods or principal component methods. Um, and then we want to really try and describe the determinants of specific exposure patterns. So if we find that certain people have high air pollution but low, um, low phthalate exposure, for example, what, what, are the what are the characteristics of these people? Uh, are they from specific socioeconomic status, for, from specific countries? From, uh, there, there's a, a lot of questions we can ask here, just looking at the, the patterns of exposure. So then we have a work package that tries to integrate the molecular exposure signatures. And here the aim is to determine molecular signatures associated with environmental exposures through the analysis of omics profiles of metabolites, proteins, RNA transcripts, and DNA methylation. 
And and uh, the the aim here is to capture the biological responses to exposure in an untargeted holistic way. So we're really looking at uh, how the exposures can influence our profile, our biological profiles, and we want to maybe use this to identify exposure biomarkers, but specifically biomarkers for exposure to complex mixtures or to, to cumulative exposure experiences. And then a third reason why the omics are important is that um, we hope that it will un help us to understand the molecular mechanisms behind uh, exposure, exposome-related health effects. So the, the areas that we focus on in Helix are metabolomics, where we will use uh, both uh, we will use both plasma and urine samples, uh, and in plasma we will use a, a fairly targeted LCMS method using the Biocritis platform. That, that looks at more than 200 metabolites. And in the urines, we will use a, a, a more untargeted uh, NMR and LCMS methods. Um, because we have uh, a lot of repeat urine samples, uh, we will also be able to look at the short-term variability in the metabolome. Then for proteomics, we use very targeted methods based on the uh, Luminex platform. For transcriptomics, uh, we will probably use the adjuvant arrays for, for coding RNAs and small non-coding RNAs. And we will do RNA, RNA sequencing for, for microRNAs. And then uh, we will measure DNA methylation using uh, the 450K lumina platform. How, uh, how we will actually implement these omics is, is um, Firstly, we will aim uh, at doing this in the repeat biosamples from the panel studies. So here we will have these omics methods applied to the two blood samples that are taken at the end of each of the panel weeks, and also to the, metabol the metabolome measured in the repeat urine samples taken every day. And that will allow us to look at variability between days and between seasons, and it will allow us to uh, to look at the impact of our short-term exposure data on uh, our omics markers. Um, because for that one week of the panel studies, we will have very, very good uh, personal exposure data for air pollution, for some of the non-persistent chemicals. And uh, that will allow us to look at the omics uh, signature at the end of that week. Uh, here's an example of the variability work that we're doing uh, with the urine and the metabolome. metabolome. So here, uh, the metal metabolomics group at Imperial College has started analyzing samples from, the, from our panel studies, and they're looking at a variability, day-to-day -day variability, and variability between the morning and bedtime samples um, in the first 20 subjects. Uh, from our panel studies. And they are, this is an example of one metabolite lactate, but they're doing this for, um, for a very uh, wide range of, of metabolites. <coughs> the second part of the omics uh, work is based in the sub cohort, where in the children, in the examinations of the children, we are collecting new blood samples. Um, at the end of their uh, visit, and those samples will be used uh, to measure, again, the same range of omics markers, so that they can be used uh, to link to long-term exposure data. We have a few a priori exposure areas where we want to focus, and that includes air pollution, environmental tobacco smoke, and uh, persistent organic pollutants. We've picked those because we have good, um, good long-term exposure data for those exposures. Um, here also we will be able to link to health outcome data, mainly continuous health outcome data. We will analyze biological pathways, so we will do pathway analyses and possibly potent there is potential to do uh, analyses across different omics techniques uh, to try and integrate all the omics uh, that we use. So 
So that's the protocol for our Onyx work. And then finally, the third step of the project is to, to relate this internal and external exposome to, to child health. And um, we have a work package on, uh, on the development of the statistical tools and on the statistical analysis to characterize the short and medium term effect of the exposome on specific high prevalent child health outcomes. Those are the three areas I've already mentioned. So a, a large part of the work in this work package is on the development of statistical tools that can focus on multiple exposures and incorporate measurement error. As I've shown, we will have quite intensive uh, work in the panel studies on the on the variability and on the uncertainties in exposures. And it would be uh, it would be very nice if we could take that into account in in our statistical uh, models. So, um, what we're going to have in terms of linking the exposome to child health is risk estimate, first of all, for many single exposures, which is a, a, a very agnostic uh, hypothesis generating uh, analysis. And this is the environmental equivalent to a GWAS. So we would do an EWAS, which is an environment-wide association study with correction for the, for the FDR. Um, and that could look like this. This is an example. This is not a real study, but it's a picture of, of what uh, an EWAS study might look like. <coughs> We've already we're, we're in the process of developing an exposome R package that can actually deal with these type of data analysis. Um, <coughs> and there have been studies published. Uh, with very similar uh, Manhattan plots for um, environmental exposure. So that would be a first step of our statistical analysis, uh, analyzing the whole range of exposures with each of our outcome areas. Of course, these analyses are limited. And the main reason why they are limited is because the exposures are not independent. They are correlated, especially, and this, is, this is again, is an example of our IMAC cohort where we've looked at all the correlations between the exposures we have already measured. And what we see is that there are, within, especially within certain exposure groups, a lot of correlations. If we stick to purely EWAS type analyses, we cannot take account of these uh, correlations. <coughs> we have to look for other methods. And that the second step of our, our statistical analysis is to look at uh, what the, the, the best methods for um, combining exposure variables. And this includes uh, dimension reduction techniques. <coughs> such as PLS type regression methods uh, and Asian profile regression methods. And then there are variable selection approaches that are very, could be very useful here, including Bayesian variable selection and elastic net uh, methods. Now, before actually being able to give some guidelines to uh, on how to analyze our, our, the data in Helix, we are uh, currently conducting simulation studies to look at the performance of various of these methods uh, <coughs> on data sets um, that, such as the one we will generate in Helix. So there's a lot of simulation work going now, ongoing now within our groups to, um, to try and understand better how these uh, methods perform in an exposome study. And this is just an example of the Bayesian profile regression, which is uh, study that looked at uh, the joint effects of multiple risk factors on lung cancer risk. And what this does is it tries to create uh, clusters of, of participants, of, of case and controls in this case, with uh, different risk profiles. So in the first group, uh, this first group of people has an alteration 1.71 and is characterized by high pol air pollution exposure, for example. The second group is are characterized by high occupational exposure, and the third group is characterized by low exposures. And in this case, in this way, you can distinguish uh, between uh, lung cancer risks uh, depending on the exposure uh, profile of a particular.
particular group of people. So this is one of the type of methods we would like to apply in, in Helix finally. Um, of course, there's many issues in the development of the statistical analysis protocol that we are now uh, uh, thinking of and, and developing, uh, how to integrate measurement error, covariate adjustments, uh, our multiple cohorts, how to deal with nonlinear associations, and how to deal with all the longitudinal and temporal aspects of the study. And this picture is just a little illustration of, of how, you know, we're, we're dealing with exposures with very different temporal scenarios. And these are just examples of six different types of exposures. One exposure that peaks just after birth, but is fairly constant afterwards. Uh, the green exposure with a very high variability all the way through, but very low exposure. So even though we, we might be able to look at an EWAS analysis at one time point, that doesn't really allow us to look at all the, the, the longitudinal and time aspects. And this is a, a much more complicated uh, issue that needs much more further work. Um, as I said, there's also a last work package that will look at the environmental burden of the disease, where the main aim is, uh, first of all, to estimate the burden of common childhood diseases that may be attributed to multiple environmental exposures in Europe. Uh, we know that there are already uh, there's several exercises looking at environmental burden of disease in, in adults. And this is an example. Uh, we in Europe uh, trying to look at nine targeted risk factors and estimating the burden of, of disease. Um, in children, there's not there are no comprehensive calculations like that. We have uh, one example where the environmental burden of um, of neurodevelopmental disorders has been calculated by Philippe Grandjean and his colleagues. Uh, but this, this type of work could be extended further, uh, first of all, to Europe, because we work on a European project. That we, we need some European estimates, and um, also to other health outcomes and other exposures. So that's one part of the work package is, is uh, currently uh, looking at how to best set up the uh, uh, burden of disease estimates. Another part of this work package will look at specific health impact assessment scenarios, and specifically uh, looking at moving away from one exposure, one outcome scenarios to more complex models with risk-benefit scenarios. And they're, they're, they're thinking of, of models, for example, looking at active transportation. And here we will use data from the Helix project, but also from, from other European cohorts and the cohort network that we've built up in previous European projects and other population-based data sources. So that's, um, that's uh, summarizing all the work that is planned within Helix. Uh, we started a year and a half ago, and we're now in the middle of our field work. So we, uh, we hope to have our first results maybe in a year's time for the for the outdoor exposure, and then the years after that for the um, for the biomarker based work. So this will take uh, a couple of years before the first uh, results will be will be ready. But finally, what we really hope to achieve with this project is a is a data warehouse with where in the same individuals we will have. Uh, Estimates of many pre- and postnatal uh, exposures, both individual and outdoor exposures, in the same database, together with the omics biomarkers and the child health outcomes. Uh, and having all this in the same individuals using uh, the same protocol um, will be a big achievement, I think. And it will create a, a, a resource for uh, exposure and research for, for many years to come, we hope. Um, we also hope that we will make some contribution to the development of tools for exposure and research. And these are the main areas, the, the personal exposure monitoring and the personal exposure monitoring kits that, are, that we're now using uh, will be important. Um, and then things like the QGIS, 
that could be very interesting for, for future epidemiological studies. The statistical method development, I think, will be very important. Um, the R package that we're putting together for exposome analysis uh, could well be useful for future research. Um, we are also there to evaluate the many challenges of the exposome. So in the end, we will draw many lessons from this project. Uh, it's a bit early now to give all the lessons, but uh, I'm sure there will be many in a few years' time. We also hope that uh, by focusing on one time point, uh, we know we can't build a, a, a life course exposome, but we hope that this will give us a first step, like a, a sort of proof of principle study towards a, a life course exposome. And then we're really looking for strong interactions with uh, exposome researchers worldwide. So I very much hope that this webinar will be um, well, will be used widely, and we'll we'll um, we'll get people to contact us for uh, for interactions and collaborations. Uh, and then finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, the full Helix Consortium, which, as I said before, we have 13 partners and, and many many people working on uh, on this project. Uh, so I would I would like to thank all my uh, Helix. Uh, partners for the work that's gone into this project so far. And that's it. Thank you.